All right, welcome ladies and gentlemen to the next lesson in our series. Uh, now we're going to talk about sexual reproduction and we're going to focus mostly on the process that allows for sexual reproduction, otherwise known as meiosis, which you can also call meiosis. I will vary between both pronunciations because honestly, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> All right, so very quickly, I want to go over a few things from an evolutionary perspective. So um, uh, let's talk about what is the purpose behind sexual reproduction. So you'll remember from back when we were talking about evolution, for over a billion years, uh, all organisms on the planet were uh, single-celled, um, probably for more than a billion years, probably took... <laughs> billion and a half to two billion years minimum for us to have some multicellular creatures uh, evolve. So before we had multicellular creatures, all organisms reproduced asexually. Uh, they reproduced by binary fission, which is basically making a copy of their single chromosome because those early organisms were fairly simple and making clones of each other. Unfortunately, there is a limitation when you have a population made of nothing but clones. If all organisms are identical, that means they're likely to respond to changes in the environment identically. And a lot of times that would mean death or dramatic reduction in population. The only way to have any genetic variation in, introduced into the population was through random mutations. And mutations, um, most of the time, are not beneficial. Uh, a lot of the times they're either negatively uh, affecting an organism, so they'll reduce evolutionary fitness, or um, they'll be kind of neutral and not have an effect. So it's not very effective if you want to maintain a population with high genetic variability and the ability to uh, adapt to changing environmental conditions to have only asexual reproduction. So like I said, one way that you could increase genetic variation is to increase your mutation rate, but then you run the risk of wasting resources to produce organisms that aren't fit to survive if they have a negative uh, mutation. Um, another way that you could go about this is you could increase genetic recombination. So uh, that ended up, that's a more viable method. Um, it gives you the benefits of increased genetic variation without the risks that are inherent in increasing the mutation rate. So that increases the survival of the, the chances of survival of the species as a whole. And that became kind of the, the more common method of reproduction for multicellular organisms, definitely. Uh, so one of the advantages is uh, us as eukaryotic organisms tend to have pairs of chromosomes. So we tend to have multiple copies of every gene. Uh, for most of the uh, organisms, most of the cases we're going to talk about will probably be more like mammals. We tend to have two sets of, of chromosomes. So we have double the genes, uh, which is very good because if you don't have an extra copy or a backup copy of a gene, that can be problematic. So um, let's say that you're a single-celled creature. You've got a single copy of a gene that helps you digest glucose. Without this gene, you won't be able to produce any energy, any ATP, and that's going to be fatal. If you have a single copy of that gene and something happens where that gene is no longer functional, then you're no longer functional, you're gonna die. However, if you have two copies of that gene and one copy mutates so that it functions differently, well, you still have the original copy, what we call a wild type allele or the kind of more uh, widely distributed allele in a, in a population. And that wild type allele or original copy of the gene is gonna keep you alive, keep you functioning. So this allows a little bit of freedom where you can have mutations happen without necessarily killing an organism. You can also have different variants of a, a trait. So um, like, for example, let's go with the stereotypical blonde hair versus brown hair. Uh, in different environments, you might find an advantage to having blonde hair versus brown hair. Um, if you have multiple copies of a, a gene, then you can carry some of those different traits in a population without necessarily um, like destroying an organism. So um, we'll talk about more examples when we talk about genetics. Also, you can have combinations of these different alleles and that's gonna increase genetic variation. So uh, by those different combinations, I mean, you can have like, for example, heterozygotes, you can have, 
homozygotes and you can have like dominants and recessives and so on. So most eukaryotes are um, going to, most of the eukaryotes we talk about are going to have these diploid and haploid stages of life. We as animals tend to have primarily a diploid life cycle. There are other organisms, for example, fungi will tend to uh, spend most of their time in a haploid life cycle. Um, and then there are some plants that will spend half their time as diploid and half their time as haploid. Um, we'll talk about this ploidy, diploid versus haploid, on another slide. Some organisms can have more than a couple of sets of chromosomes. These are called polyploid organisms, and I'm going to tell you the vast majority of these are plants. When we're talking about the number of chromosomes in a set of chromosomes, we abbreviate that number N. So let's talk about this in terms of humans. Humans have 46 chromosomes, but what you should remember is that they come in pairs. So, in reality, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but you have 23 chromosomes per set. So, let's say 23 chromosomes per set. How many sets of chromosomes do we have? Well, we have 23 times 2. We have two sets of chromosomes, and we're rep representing the number of chromosomes in a set with the number n. So humans, in each set of chromosomes, we have 23. In our diploid cells, which have two full sets of chromosomes, we have 2 times 23 chromosomes. We have 46 chromosomes. A haploid cell would have only one set of chromosomes, so diploid cells are 2n. They have two times uh, however many chromosomes you have in one set, and haploid chromosome, uh, haploid cells, you only have one N or one set of chromosomes. So we'll talk about that in more detail as we go along, so that way you guys can get more used to that concept. So this is where I talk about haploid versus diploid. So notice if we have an organism like what we have here that has only three chromosomes in a set, notice all of these chromosomes are different from each other and they will all carry copies of different genes. So they'll have genes for different traits. Notice this kind of indentation that we see right here. That's our centromere. So notice the centromeres in different locations and we also have different links to these chromosomes. So this organism that we're looking at here has only three chromosomes in a set, so its haploid cells would only have three chromosomes. Whereas this other cell right here, you'll notice it has two copies of every chromosome. They are organized in homologous pairs. Each of these homologous pairs, you'll notice, has their centromere at approximately the same location. They're around the same length. Each arm of a chromosome is around the same length. So an arm is basically on one side of the centromere. So here you see uh, an arm of the chromosome that's very short. This is a long arm of a chromosome, uh, whereas this first set of chromosomes, the arms are approximately very close to equal in length. Um, what you'll notice is if we also had the banding patterns of genes, you would notice that the banding patterns are the same. So I'm just drawing some small banding patterns so that way we, I don't take a ton of time with this, but you can see they have very similar banding patterns. So in animals, our haploid cells are sperm and egg cells. These are called gametes and their main purpose is for reproduction. For animals, most of our body cells are diploid. Um, these are our somatic cells, and they'll have two sets of chromosomes. So to use humans as an example, our haploid cells are only sperm and egg cells. They have 23 chromosomes because they only have one set. So they have 1 times n chromosomes. On the other hand, diploid cells in our bodies are going to be every single cell except for sperm and egg cells, and they are going to have 2n or two sets of chromosomes. So for humans that diploid number is 46. So this is just a, a diagram showing you kind of the life cycle of an animal. We have a primarily diploid life cycle and we don't tend to exist as a separate organism as a separate haploid organism. So notice the haploid part of our life cycle is single cells.
Um, when fertilization happens, that creates a new organism, this zygote, which then um, after development will become a mature organism, which can then have some of its cells undergo meiosis to produce sperm and egg cells. And that's going to be the haploid part of the cycle again. Plants have kind of a half and half, especially some of the um, what we call the lower forms of plants like mosses or ferns will have this uh, interesting life cycle called alternation of generations. They will actually have a separate organism that is haploid. Uh, it's usually fairly small, so you would have trouble seeing it with the naked eye. In some of the higher plants like fruiting plants or cone bearing plants, angiosperms or gymnosperms, this gametophyte is not its own separate organism and it mostly exists inside the reproductive structures of what we know of as the plant. But these um, haploid structures will then create the male and female gametes or the sperm and the eggs. When they're fertilized, they'll make a zygote, which is diploid, and that will grow into a mature form that's what we tend to think of as the plant. Um, then part of that plant will undergo meiosis, usually for the plants that we're used to looking at, like trees and such, that will be in the reproductive organs. It'll produce eventually sperm and eggs. However, we have a different type of life cycle in fungi. Fungi tend to have this primarily haploid life cycle where they'll only come together briefly to form a diploid organism. So uh, what will happen is their mature organism will be a haploid organism. It will, through mitosis or just simple cell reproduction, produce some gametes, which are going to be male, the sperm, and female, the egg cells. Those will fertilize each other and create a zygote, which will exist for a brief period of time. It will undergo meiosis to produce those haploid cells, which will then go on to produce the mature organism. By the way, just a note, um, we as humans have actually taken plants and encouraged polyploidy, so we've bred them so that way they'll have more than two sets of chromosomes. For example, this guy right here, pictured on the right, is an original diploid banana. Notice it doesn't have a lot of flesh to it, so if you were eating this, um, and it's got larger seeds, so if you were eating this, wouldn't be the same as eating like a, a modern banana. However, we've bred them over time and most are normal bananas that are um, uh, raised and then sent to the supermarket for us to eat are octoploid, meaning they have eight sets of chromosomes. Um, so basically most of the fruits and vegetables we're eating are polyploid because they produce larger fruit or larger um, seed structures, which are the things we tend to eat. So let's talk about homologous chromosomes. Homologous pr chromosomes, when we're talking about diploid organisms, you'll tend to have inherited one of them from uh, your father, one of them from your mother, so we can talk about maternal versus paternal chromosomes. Uh, notice that they have these same banding patterns and they also have these genes for the same uh, trait. So notice these happen to have uh, happen to have uh, be homozygous. So uh, for a certain trait, they might be homozygous dominant. Uh, in this example, you have these uh, this different trait for which this is a homozygous recessive individual. And then for yeah, a third trait, a third gene that's located on this chromosome, you have a heterozygous individual. So depending on the individual alleles you have on each chromosome, that's going to determine the genotype of the organism. A couple of terms, a genetic locus. A locus is a location. So if we're talking about a locus or the plural form is loci, um, those are the locations on the actual chromosome. And um, you can actually, like if you're doing more genetic detailed um, studies or studying genetics in college, you'll actually be like referring to certain loci when you talk about specific genes. So, um, before we undergo meiosis and produce sperm and egg cells, um, it's actually uh, what happens is we reproduce the DNA in our cells. So we have pairs of homologous chromosomes. So one of these is a maternal copy, the other is a paternal copy. Notice the centromeres in the same location, they're about the same length. Well, they are replicated before meiosis. So they exist as a pair of sister chromatids, and each pair of sister chromatids has a homologous pair of sister chromatids. So 
Notice that this set of chromosomes, or this pair of sister chromatids, is the same color. That's representing that they're identical copies. If you were actually to sequence those, um, those uh, chromosomes, they would be absolutely identical in every way with the exception of if there were some mutations. But um, they would both be like, say, for example, this was the maternal copy and this was the paternal copy. Both of the green chromatids that are linked here by the centromere are both identical copies of the maternal chromosome. Same thing here with the purple chromatids. Those are identical copies of the paternal chromosomes. So notice you have a pair of pairs. And I know that gets a little confusing. I am kind of presenting this in a slightly different way than you might have gotten in other biology classes because this always stumped me when I was studying biology myself. Um, I was always wondering, well, if you're just trying to split up your chromosomes, why would you go through the energy and the effort of um, reproducing and making extra copies of all of your DNA? And the reason for this is meiosis is not something that evolved out of nowhere. What it is, it's actually a modification of mitosis. And if you'll notice before mitosis happens, you reproduce your chromosomes. So you'll notice that meiosis is just very super similar to mitosis with a few exceptions that I'll point out. And the reason for that is I envision something happening, some mutation happening where instead of <clears throat> an organism dividing up its chromosomes once for normal mitosis, it accidentally did that twice and ended up producing these haploid cells. Of course, I don't have any scientific evidence to back that up, but you never know. Maybe one of y'all will publish a paper that proves that. Remember, mention your AP Bio teacher for that. So after S phase, which is the synthesis phase during which a cell is going to produce DNA, let's count up how many sets of chromosomes there are. So notice that we have this pair of homologous chromosomes, each of which consists of a duplicated pair of sister chromatids. So let's start counting sets of chromosomes. Here we have one set, uh, two sets, three sets, and four sets. So after replication before meios, oh, my bad, guys. After replication before meiosis, you actually have a 4N cell. It's got four separate sets of chromosomes in it. By the time we finish, you are going to have four single separate cells, each of which has a single set of chromosomes in it. So in the very end, you're going to end up with four 1N cells. So let's go through the process of meiosis. Um, as like in mitosis, uh, you're going to duplicate your chromosomes, but what's different from mitosis is instead of you just lining up your chromosomes at the center of the cell, you're going to pair up homologous chromosomes. And we're going to look at the process of this in just a moment because it's got some important consequences. My meiosis is like mitosis times two. We call it a reduction division because it reduces or halves the number of chromosomes. Um, so you can divide it into two sections. In the first division, you're going to separate your homologous chromosomes. In your separate, I mean, in your second uh, division, you're going to separate your sister chromatids. So notice the actual transition from diploid to haploid happens during the first division. And during the second division, you start out with haploid cells, and you're just making an identical copy of that haploid cell. So uh, let's go ahead and look at this process. This is an overview of meiosis one. Uh, I like these diagrams like this because they'll show you a microscope image. At the top, there's an explanation, and then there's a, a drawn diagram, so you can kind of see the stylized version of how this happens. Once again, just like with mitosis, you do not have to memorize the names of the uh, uh, the phases, what you need to realize is that there's alignment at the center. Um, in this case, the homologous chromosomes are aligning. They are separated from each other, and then you have division happen. Uh, what's important is um, also during meiosis one, you have these uh, homologous chromosomes that are going to uh, join together. They're going to engage in something called synapsis. During synapsis, these pairs of homologous chromosomes are going to form these overlapping points. They're called chiasmata. So anywhere you have those homologous chromosomes overlapping, those are chiasmata. A single one would be a chiasma, which literally means X. Um, when you have these 
four sister chromatids aligned like this that's called a tetrad. And the important point of this is that at these uh, chiasmata, you can actually have what's called crossing over. Crossing over is where these chromosomes or these chromatids are basically exchanging bits of each other. So what's going to happen is, let's say your maternal chromosomes are, let's say this is your maternal chromosome and this is your paternal chromosome. In the end, you'll have a chromatid that's uh, completely maternal. You'll have another chromatid that's completely paternal, but then you'll have these two middle chromatids will be hybrids. And this is a very common place to have some mutations happen because sometimes this can happen and crossing over can happen in the middle of a gene. It's also a way to increase genetic variation. And you'll notice that's what meiosis all, is all about, increasing genetic variation. Um, ignore this. I forgot to take this off. Uh, so this is where uh, Mendel's law of independent assortment is ultimately derived from. Now, when Gregor Mendel was doing his genetic work with peas, he had no idea that all this stuff was going on with chromosomes. What it took was later scientists looking at the movement of chromosomes during meiosis um, and kind of getting the uh, the brainstorm, the great idea, hey, this kind of matches with what I read in that guy Mendel's paper to realize that this was the actual molecular basis for Mendel's law of independent assortment. What he concluded is he concluded that traits would be inherited independently of each other, meaning like he was studying things like yellow versus green and say wrinkled uh, peas versus smooth. Well, what he would notice is you would inherit, if you were a pea plant, the, the trait for having yellow peas independently of the color of the, the peas would be inherited independently of any other trait. So you could have any combination. You could have yellow wrinkled peas, yellow smooth peas. You could have green wrinkled peas or green smooth peas. These traits were inherited independently of each other. And there's actually a chromosomal basis for this. So let's say that you have, um, you have uh, on this chromosome right here, Let's say you have the trait for yellow versus green. I'm going to represent that with a G. And then on the second chromosome, let's say you have the trait for be being wrinkled versus smooth. I'm going to represent that with an R. So the paternal chromosome, we'll say, has all dominance, and the maternal chromosome, we're going to say, has all recessives. So notice when these are being separated during um, meiosis, you can have different combinations of these guys made. You could end up inheriting um, both dominants. You could end up inheriting both recessives. Or you could end up inheriting a dominant for one trait and a recessive for the other trait. Or similarly, recessive for one trait and dominant for the other trait. These guys are inherited independently of each other because they're on different chromosomes. Since they're on different chromosomes um, and it's not uh, exactly like, um, it's not determined that you have to inherit all maternal chromosomes or all paternal chromosomes in one gamete versus another, this is another way to increase uh, genetic variation. So you can create these different combinations of alleles that will end up in each gamete. So this is meiosis 2. Meiosis 2 is very similar to mitosis. It's pretty much identical. You're just separating pretty much identical copies. The major exception that it's n the major way it's not the same as mitosis is you'll notice this chromosome right here has a weird hybrid chunk. That's the result of crossing over with the sister chromatid. So notice that this chunk right here looks like it comes from this chromosome, which is the homologous chromosome. You're not going to have crossing over between these two chromosomes because they don't have the same genes. So they'll have different sequences. So notice now you've created these four um, different gametes each of which can have different combinations of traits, um, and which of these gametes then will go on to fertilize or be fertilized by another gamete is completely random. So let's say this is producing sperm cells. 
um, any of these four sperm cell combinations could then go on to fertilize an egg cell. And that's where we get into the probability of genetics. So let's say there's a certain trait here. Let's say there's a trait here of, we're going to call it A. That's our dominant allele for that trait. Well, this guy is going to inherit that. Let's say this guy is going to inherit that. This guy is not going to inherit that, and this guy is not going to inherit that. So you have a two out of four or one in two chance of inheriting that allele. And if you're like, oh, Mr., you're kind of going all over the place here, when we get through the genetics uh, notes, this should hopefully become clearer. <clears throat> In fact, I recommend after you watch the genetics notes, you come back and rewatch the meiosis notes because hopefully it'll make things a little clearer uh, as to what was happening during meiosis. So what is this process called? Well, the process of making gametes, in addition to being called meiosis, is also called gametogenesis. Gametogenesis is the process of making gametes. And since we have two different gametes that can be made, you have two different names. So spermatogenesis makes sperm. Oogenesis makes eggs. Um, spermatogenesis will make four equally sized sperm cells. Oogenesis is a little different. Um, what ends up happening is since the egg cell uh, will be fertilized with the sperm cell and will, until the point at which, at least in humans, it implants in the uterus, uh, that egg cell will provide all the nutrition, all of the building blocks that are necessary to create a, a zygote and a fertilized egg cell and um, uh, basically the beginnings of an organism, uh, it's going to have to have a huge amount of cytoplasm. So what ends up happening is you have a meiotic division. You are dividing up your chromosomes in the exact same way, but your cytokinesis is unequal. So all of your cytoplasm is kind of condensed into one egg. And the other three cells that are produced are kind of like waste products. They're just trashed. So what you see here is this in diagrammatic form where you have four identical sperm cells that are made for each round of meiosis in uh, the testicles. In the ovaries, however, what happens is you have only one egg cell produced from each round of meiosis, and it's going to be a ginormous one, uh, which is going to contain most of the cytoplasm. You can have some errors happen during meiosis. We'll talk about them also in more detail when we talk about um, mutations, but non-disjunction is what happens when homologous chromosomes don't separate from each other. So what you see here is instead of separating and going to opposite ends of the cell, these homologous chromosomes are kind of stuck with each other. That results in an unequal division of chromosomes. And you'll notice here, instead of having n chromosomes, you have n plus 1, you have 1 extra. Here, you have n minus 1, you have 1 less than you're supposed to. You can also have non-disjunction happen of sister chromatids, and that's going to also result in an uneven distribution of chromosomes. If one of these gametes that's formed is then fertilized by or fertilizes another gamete, you can have what's called a trisomy. Uh, an organism who has a trisomy has three copies of a single chromosome. These are the most common trisomies that are found in humans. By far the most common one is Down syndrome. Well, we'll talk about Turner's in a second. Um, it's a trisomy of chromosome 21, which is the smallest chromosome, aside from like the Y chromosome. And um, it's the most common trisomy that's able to survive to birth and past birth. There are a couple of other trisomies of uh, what we call the autosomes or the non-sex chromosomes. However, uh, they tend to have extreme effects. Just having an extra copy of a few hundred genes is enough to uh, significantly affect the development of a person uh, to the point where they're, they're not able to physically survive. So um, Down syndrome, uh, people with Down syndrome are actually able to live a long life. There are variations in how severe the Down syndrome is. So some of them are able to function uh, fairly independently, um, and they're able to live a, a long, fairly independent life. Uh, other people might have a more severe form of Down syndrome where they might require care for the rest of their life. Turner's is not a trisomy. It's actually the result of a trisomy that results in you having one less chromosome. So somebody with Turner's syndrome would actually have 45 chromosomes instead of 46. Uh, people with Turner's syndrome are 
physiologically female, um, and they will, um, however, not uh, be able to easily reproduce. They'll need some assistance from medical technology, and uh, they might have trouble developing some of the secondary sex characteristics that a female does. Kleinfelter's is a trisomy. It's where an individual gets two X chromosomes instead of one X chromosome with their Y. Um, these people are physically male. Um, however, they will have some differences in their physiological development post-puberty just due to the addition of that extra X chromosome. Uh, triploidy would happen if you have three copies of each chromosome. Um, and this is something I've not heard of cases happening with humans because it's usually causes such severe birth defects that, um, a, a person who's got, uh, who's triploid will probably not survive to birth. So comparing mitosis and meiosis, a lot of very similar processes take place, but the, there are some important differences. Uh, these clones can be made by mitosis. However, anything that's made by meiosis are going to be genetically distinct from each other. And meiosis makes haploid cells. Mitosis makes whatever you started with. So you can make um, like a haploid cell and make another haploid cell. And if you did that, that's by mitosis because these two are identical. You could take a diploid cell and you can make another diploid cell, and that reproduction is also mitosis because you're making something identical. However, if you go from a diploid cell down to a haploid cell, that's going to be meiosis. Oh, and going from haploid to diploid, well, you need two haploid cells, and that's fertilization. And that's usually when you have sperm and eggs involved, so gametes. All right, um, I hope that you are not super confused about mitosis, and if you are, luckily you have this video on YouTube to rewatch. Uh, feel free to subscribe so you get notifications on when the next videos are out.